Hey, um, I just want to say thank you to um, David Bailey for giving us a powerful word this past Sunday. Um, and um, David shared with us last week, and I, my big takeaway is, is on uh, the, the, your, uh, it'll be on the screen here for a second. So my big takeaway was our works, or, uh, and the way I found context with this, our works, or how we treat each other, and more specifically, in the body of Christ, keeps our faith alive, right? So faith without works, James 2.17 says, so faith by itself, if, if it does not have works, is dead, right? So this morning, um, I'm glad that you're still joining us every Sunday. And uh, as David said, uh, if it didn't hurt uh, the last few weeks, well, it will hurt today. All right, so I promise you already giving you a, head, a heads up. I'm, I'm, I'm already, um, I've been praying all this week. Uh, just say ouch. Go ahead, say ouch. I'm giving you the permission. Say ouch. It will hurt you today, all right? So just a, uh, just a brief disclosure. Uh, it's going to speak to all of us this morning. Um, how many of you have a problem with self-control? Anybody have a problem with self-control? Who does not have a problem with self-control? Raise your hand. All right, good. Because then we'd have to... Ask God. <laughs> all right, so, I, so the problem of self-control, all of us have that problem. All right, let me, let me, let me ask you this second question, a corollary question. If, for those of you that have a problem with self-control, do you have a problem with your tongue? Anybody have a problem with their tongue? Um. For those of us who have married, who have, who have just been married, or will think about getting married, this will be a problem area. <laughs> so let's read James, all right? Let's read James. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. You know, whether you misspoke or in your own mind didn't mean what you just said, we have all been hurt or have hurt with words that we have said with our tongue. So James says this, James chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. Not many of you should have become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man able to, hide, to bridle his whole body. But if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever we will, the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. And every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father. And with it we curse the people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour, pour forth from the seam, opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? 
neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? And by his conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. It's a powerful text this morning. A passage that continually speaks to us and should speak to us every day because this passage in James talks about the power of our words. Words can create, it can bring people together, but it can also drive them apart. And whether or not you and I realize this, words we choose play a significant role in shaping the communities that we're a part of. Notice what James chapter 3 verse 10 says. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. Here's, here's the context. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. James 3.12. Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine producing figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. You see... As you read James, you, it should already be in your mind that James is talking to his community, his Christian family, those who have been spread across the Middle, the Middle East. In James chapter 1, verse 2, he says, my brothers and sisters, 116, 119, 21, 25, 214, 310, 312, 411, 57. 5, 9, 5, 10, 5, 12, and 5, 19 in each and every one of these verses that I just quickly referenced, James talks and challenges them to treat one another because this is how God expects you to do this in community. And this morning, James once again challenges us to consider how we use our words how we can love, how we can subtly tear each other down. If there was a message this morning that is applicable to the church, it is this message today. David reminded us last week, it is not merely the words that you say that matter. It, it is also the words that you post on a social media or what you like or dislike and you put it down on your phone. Whether you say it or don't say it, it affects people. James reminds us this morning that teachers and leaders will be judged more strictly. I, I think here I want to just say this as, as context. This is specifically, by the way, and, and you, you know uh, the words that Jesus said in the Gospels, where he says, if, 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 if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, it is better that you, what? Take what? Take a stone, a millstone, wrap it around your neck, and what? Throw yourself to the sea, right? So, so let me just say this. In, in, in the context of a, of a world that has, that has looked to leadership and and leadership has has failed you what they teach and what they preach matter and James tells us this in James chapter 3 your words matter right and I tell you all the time a text without a context is a pretext the power of a preacher and a teacher is that more than likely you take their words verbatim. And not too many of us are like the church in Berea, in Acts, where they, where they checked up what the preacher just said. I tell you all the time, don't believe what I say. Check it out in the book. And make sure that what I say matches with what the book says. Now, I, I want to I wanna say this this morning because some of you in this place have regarded 
teachers and leaders and have been put in positions where leadership has, has hurt you or has misguided you or, and leadership has failed you. And I'm here to suggest to you this morning that, that James tells us, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So I just want to tell you this. It should give you a, a good, kind of good uh, um, foundation as a way to understand that preachers and teachers and those of us who have the honor and the privilege to, to rightly divide God's word before you are judged in much higher standards. And we're not judged by your standards. God is the God who judges. That's what James tells us, James chapter 3. My brothers, you know that we who judge will be judged with greater strictness. In light of what happened uh, all around us, understand this, that James reminds us the incredible responsibility of those of us who are preaching and teaching God's word. And for those of you who've been led astray because of the preaching and teaching of God's word, I say to you, remember, James tells us that those who do this will be judged with greater strictness. I just say that as a way to just give context to you. And uh, Johnny, can, can you help me for a second? Would you mind bringing that, uh, that board up here? Um, I just want to let you know this morning, there's a couple of things, takeaways that, that you need to understand. Uh, the first is that there, there is power in the words that we use because words have a way and give us a way to teach us uh, how we build community. All right? So... Uh, it is important for you to understand that James is asking us to build the community of faith. He understands that words matter. So this morning, the first thing that you need to understand is your words have power, especially in building the community we call the church. James chapter 3, verses 3 to 5 says this, If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships. They also are a large, large and are driven by strong winds. They are guided by a very small rudder. Wherever the will of the pilot directs, so also is the tongue a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Notice how James begins by telling us that here's a small bit that's put in a um, horse's mouth. Here's a small rudder that steers the ship. The, these small instruments control something much bigger, much like a small bit control the horse's mouth so that its path and its direction is controlled just like a tiny rudder controls and steers a whole ship likewise then brothers and sisters our tongues though small can set the course of our lives our words can steer the direction of our relationships our movements and our communities so in a world in a world that is driven by our phones. In this digital age where communication happens, a lot of our communication happens online, our words have the power to reach and influence people beyond our immediate circle. So if we're talking about shaping communities, our conversations our posts, our online presence is something that we need to start thinking about. The question that I want to ask you this morning is this. Are you using your words to build a culture that encourages, 
that empathizes and understands, or are you using your words to destroy and be divisive? Make it a habit, would you, to lift somebody up. Make it a habit to guard your tongue and let your speech be a tool to create a positive influence on, upon others. Second thing that James tells us about the tongue is that it has the potential to destroy. There is a potential for the tongue to be destructive. Notice what James tells us in James chapter 3, verses 6 through 8. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. And every kind of beast and of bird and reptile and sea creatures can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So here in this text, this passage, James describes the tongue as a tongue of fire, a small spark that can entirely consume a forest. It warns us, he warns us how quickly can words spread like wildfire, causing division, causing hurt and misunderstanding. So you and I this morning need to quickly understand that your negative comment, your criticism can escalate quickly into full-blown arguments. And we see it all the time, whether it be in our marriages or on social media. What we say can turn quickly into a full-blown argument. What does James then continue to tell us? He tells us that words can speak life and grace. Look what James chapter 3 verses 9 through 12 says. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring forth, spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce fruits? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. What is James telling us? James is telling us that there is this tool that we call the tongue, this part of our body in which can come out words of praise to God and at the same time can curse others. He challenges us that our speech, especially when we treat one another, when it, it's in reference to treating one another, our speech should be guarded. How often does our speech hurt as compared to how often does our speech encourage? How often do we talk about love and acceptance but then judge those who think differently from us. And James gives us this double-mindedness that hurts our witness and weakens our community. So what does this mean? Finally, James calls us to action. He tells us that we ought to be peacemakers. In the last verse, he who is wise and understanding among you by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. Now, I just want to just uh, give us context this morning. I tell you all the time, so uh, I hope this, this little exercise, I don't want to be a teacher, but this whole context um, is found in James chapter 3, verse 2. Notice what James says. Many of you, not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we teach, those who teach will be judged with strictness. And, and here's the context of what we've just said, right? For we all, what's the next word? Stumble. Stumble. 
for we all stumble. And by the way, in context, what does it mean? How do we stumble? Right? See, this is just, I love this. Because everybody has questions, right? How do we stumble in James? We've read the whole, the, had read 13 verses. How do we stumble? What's the context of stumbling? <clears throat> in what? Our speech. Notice how he starts it. Now, many of you should become teachers, brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged <coughs> with greater strictness. What teachers say and what they teach. Now, he says, for we all, brothers and sisters, all, what? Stumble in many ways. How do we stumble in many ways in our... Tongue. We stumble with our tongue. This is the context, James chapter 3. <clears throat> and notice what, how, if, if, if he drives the point, how does the tongue stumble? How do we know it? Well, it's like the horse who has to be what? Bridled. It's like the Ship who has to be steered. It is like the forest who has to be set on fire. The tongue, if you can't figure it out, James gives us imagery of how powerful the tongue is. It's like the horse that needs to be bridled because the bridle is how the person who is riding is, is guiding and steering the horse. The rudder is how the ship is, 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 is uh, directed, led. And then everybody understands this. It's like a small fire set in a forest can cause the entire forest to be, be destroyed by the fire. Right? Now... When you see this, you understand the progression that James gives us. And if you haven't caught it yet, in context, go to verse 6. What does James tell us about the tongue? The tongue is a... The tongue is a fire. The tongue is a fire. And what else? The tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. Okay, so think about this. Your tongue is unrighteous. This is why you Christian, and, and by the way, James has talked to my brothers and sisters. This is why you Christian, and the world looks at you and sees you, sees you what you say, your tongue is unrighteous. When you got saved, the tongue didn't get saved. It's unrighteous. It's a fire. It is a world. I love James. He says it is a, it's the text, right? What is it? It is a world of unrighteousness. Just because you're a Christian does not mean you have a saved tongue. As a matter of fact, James says, because you are a Christian, you ought to understand that your tongue is a fire. It is a world of unrighteousness. Now, if you haven't caught that yet, look what the text tells us about the tongue. And let me just make it, it's right there. It's in your, it, it's in your Bible. The tongue is, it, 
he says it stains. What does it stain? The body. <laughs> it stains the body. Not only does it stain the body, what does it say here? It It sets the course of your life. That's what the text tells you. It sets the course of your life. If your tongue continues to spew negative things, guess what you will be? A negative person. Because the tongue sets the course of your life. If your tongue is full of criticism, the tongue will set the course of your life and you will be a critical person. The tongue is a fire. It is a world of unrighteousness and it stains your body and it sets the course of your life. And I love what James continues to say. And who can tame the tongue? I mean, beasts and animals are tamed. Look, at, look what he says. For every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human person can tame the tongue. So what has happened here? Here's what happens. I don't have enough room here. The tongue can't be tamed. All right. So, fell. What does that mean? Well, your tongue can't be tamed. What's, what, what, should that, what should that ask you then? What, what should be the next question? If James has said, my tongue can't be tamed. No human can tame the tongue. What should be the next thing that, come out, that comes out of our mouth? How do you tame it? Then how do you tame it? How do you do it? How can we tame the tongue? As a matter of fact, I love this, that word tame if you want to do a, a deep dive into that word tame, it occurs only four times in the New Testament. It occurs in three verses four times. It occurs in Mark chapter 5 verse 4, James chapter 3, here in James chapter 3 verse 7 and verse 8. Notice what verse 7 says. For every kind of bird and and beasts and reptile and creature can be tamed and has been tamed. There's the two times by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue the third time. And then the fourth time is found in, in, in Mark chapter four, uh, chapter, excuse me, chapter five, verse four. So how can that, how, how, how can you and I tame the tongue? So let me be. Let me give you hope today. Since now we're like handcuffed. <laughs> like, okay, my tongue is, is, is unsaved. It is a fire. It, sets, it stains my body, sets my, my life on its course. How do I not, if I want to truly be a follower of Jesus, this can't be so. It can't spew forth blessing and cursing, salt and fresh. It can't be that. So what does is, what is James tell us? Verse 13, finally, we get to our answer. James 4.13 says, Who is... And who has who is wise? Who has understanding? 
if I know my tongue is a fire and my tongue stains my body and sets the course of my life and I don't understand this, You know how you can see if Christians can, be, can have understanding? Just watch them. Listen to how they speak. Because they show in their speech how much understanding they have. Let me give you, and let me wrap this up by a couple of stories. It happened this morning. One of my stories. Um, we had a little tiff with my seven-year-old. I helped him because his 10-year-old brother was, uh, so to speak, uh, enforcing himself upon his seven-year-old brother. Of course, my 10-year-old son is way bigger than his seven-year-old brother for full disclosure. And I come to find out that um, he needed my help. I could hear it too, by the way. <laughs> Those of you that have sons understand what I'm talking about. If you don't, ask someone who do when you're on your way out. So I, I helped him. I was on his side, and uh, I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up. Um, so I helped him. He was, I um, helped him kind of mediate the situation. So I was on his side. But then we understood that he wasn't not without fault. We found out that he had broken a gift that his, other, his um, brother had given him and opening the present that he wasn't supposed to open. That's what started the whole thing. So we corrected him. And after we corrected him, I'm getting ready. I thought he was getting ready. He's standing on the, on the, on the hallway overlooking the, the, the living room, and he looks at me, and he says, I don't love you. Wow. I just helped you get out of a mess. <laughs> and now you're telling me you don't love me. What did he lack? Yeah, wisdom, but he lacked understanding, right? He lacked understanding. Now, here's how we kind of manage this because we say he didn't mean what he said. Don't we say that to people? Don't we come to people and they say stupid stuff and hurtful stuff? And we give them out. We tell them, we say to ourselves, they don't really mean that. They, they, but in fact, they did mean it. What they didn't have is understanding. The reason why they didn't have understanding is they weren't wise. Rather, they were foolish. They were fools. Foolish. So let me just say this downright. I know it's going to hurt you. But let me say it because I'm your pastor this morning. Don't be a fool. Don't be foolish. Just because you don't have understanding, be wise. Don't be foolish. Quit acting like fools. 
Because what you say hurt. What you post, whether you meant it or not meant it, shows you lack understanding. And you're not wise. Because you don't understand that your tongue is unsaved. You don't understand that your tongue stains your body and your tongue sets the course of your life. You don't have enough understanding to read God's word and to apply God's word to your tongue. So how do we respond? Let me end it. Who is wise? And understanding among you. Notice. <laughs> I've been saying ouch all week, by the way, brothers and sisters. You're just getting it today. I've been getting it all week long as I've been reading this text. By his Good. By the way, my son was learning today, this week, adjectives. What is an adjective? It's a word that describes a a noun. By his good conduct. How am I supposed to judge you? How am I supposed to see how you are a follower of Jesus? To see that you are wise and understanding, I know by your good conduct. How is this tied with a bow? And James says this word. In the meekness, another word, by the way, is humility. Let me read how the message gives us this text of scripture. Maybe it'll make more sense. Do you want to be counted wise to build a reputation of wisdom? Here's what you do. Live well. Live wisely. Live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. What if, what if you live the life where you say, God, help me to be wise, help me to be understanding, so that I can conduct myself in a way that my conduct, my conduct is good. Help me to live this out in humility and weakness and meekness. How would, first of all, your life change? Then let me ask you, those of you that are married, how would your marriage change? How would your families change? Well, pastor, you know I have ADHD, ADD. I can't help it. And my last, my last 
illustration for you. I have done a lot of weddings. And um, there's been a lot of faux pas in weddings in my life. I've seen brides go unconscious and faint in the middle of my wedding. I've seen um, groomsmen, bridesmaids faint because they lock their knees and fall out, all sorts of stuff. But there was this one time I had a wedding where the bride wanted to sing a song for her husband to be in the wedding. And she asked if I knew of someone who could sing a duet with her. And man, I had a lot of friends that can just sing. Sang. So I hooked her up with one of my friends, and uh, my friend Art was singing uh, a duet with this. And in practice, it sounded really good. Unfortunately, in the wedding, a lot of nerves came to play, and she just didn't find the key. God bless her soul, she tried. It wasn't, it was all right when it was by herself not finding the key. You can tell it's not finding the key because the, 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 you know, the background music is going and she's singing and she's not hitting it, you know. And as she was doing this, the bridesmaids started snickering. She's in front of her husband, the groom. She's singing it. And then my friend came in. He could sing. He did good until the duet part came along. And that was even worse. Because she, she still didn't get it. Now, what happened was, not only did the bridesmaid start to snicker, now I'm still, I'm seeing, hearing, seeing, hearing people snickering all over the place. I'm watching the bridal party. They're losing it. And I am standing in the front. This is happening in front of me. I'm standing in the front. And for the first time in my life, I have never bit my tongue so hard. I think I was drawing blood to try not to do what? Laugh. Words matter. Snickers matter. Right? And I, I say this to tell you the good news in this whole thing. I mean, think about this, three or four minutes long. This is, this is forever going. And that groom, God bless his soul. How did he do it? That groom stood there with just the same, the same, straight face and held his composure because I guarantee you he never heard anyone else but rather he just saw his beautiful bride give him the greatest gift so far that he could she could give him and he kept a straight face throughout that entire duet because he looked beyond her off-pitch voice.
and he had understanding he had understanding and he was wise that produced for him a good conduct in humility knowing that this is the love of my life it's my wedding and what should be my response? You do well, brothers, to be counted as wise, to build a reputation of wisdom if you live well if you live wisely, if you live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that really counts. And as James would say, because you know James is from Southern Missouri, right? You say you're a Christian? Show me. Jesus please forgive me today words I have spoken words that I have misspoken words that I have said in anger words that I have rashly said words that have hurt Please forgive me. I want to be wise. I want to have understanding. I want my life to reflect a good conduct. Help me to live in humility, in meekness. Ultimately, God. I want my life to reflect you. I pray that today in Jesus' name.